did you know that there is a Windows service that 9 out of 10 times allows an attacker to escalate privileges to system or even compromise a remote client if he detects the service is running on the Windows machine inside the network? The service is called Web Client and it initially is designed to allow party to share resources over the WebDAV protocol. Now the problem here comes when you combine the WebDAV service with relay in attacks. Keep in mind that I already created a blog post about this topic and you can access it in the link in the description. Now let me explain why the WebDAV protocol is actually a problem. It's actually a problem because we can perform relay attack with coercion. Now relay attack is when we get an authentication from a party and we forward it to somewhere else and then mimic in or impersonating the same authentication. Now this is usually considered man in the middle but there are things and techniques that can help us do that on purpose. So for instance when we set up a relay and then coerce the authentication towards us we can forward it to anywhere we want. Usually, there are some mechanisms that prevent us from doing such attacks. For instance, LDAP channel binding, LDAP signing, SLB signing, and so on and so on and so on. But when these things lack, the environment is quite vulnerable. When the mentioned settings are disabled or even enabled, cross relay attacks are possible. These attacks allow me to capture the incoming authentication over one protocol, let's say SMB, and then forward it to any else, for example, LDAP. This is dangerous because this allows me to do many, many more things than just the same protocol relay. Now, the interesting part is that when we're talking about web client, it becomes even more vulnerable because the web client is operating under HTTP protocol, which, by the way, is known to be vulnerable, right? The HTTP protocol here mentioned on the graph can be cross related to LDAP as explained in this square. By the way, I highly recommend saving this graph and always checking back when you're doing some kind of relay attacks. It shows what's possible under which settings. On the bottom side, on the top side, sorry, we have the server side and signing and channel binding, both disabled, enabled and required. And then we have the same settings for the client. We can see that even if the channel binding is enabled, where most of the case is, the cross relay attack from HTTP is still possible with web client. Obviously, as the diagram says, when it's required or enforced, the cross relay attacks are not possible at all, so that's why it's always recommended to have this kind of settings enforced. But now we have an environment where it's not, so let's see what can happen. I want to interrupt the video just for a second to say thank you to my Patreon sponsors. I appreciate you with all of my heart. If you have further appreciation to the channel as well, don't hesitate to become my Patreon, where you can get access to my Shadowburn private packer, some private notes, and other private hidden gems. Appreciate you so much and moving on. In order to showcase what can go wrong when you have web client service enabled, I go back to my local whalesac.walko environment and I'm gonna operate from here. And from there, let's observe if the web client is actually enabled. There are assemblies and tools that can help us remotely enumerate if specific web client instance is enabled on which machines. Such repositories, I'm gonna link into the description of that video so you can use them to verify for yourself and add them to your arsenal. Now here we have the tool get webdav status, but that thing requires one argument and this argument is our IP address. I'm not sure if, if, if it can support the minus H setting, looks like it does not, but never mind, we want to check the web, web client status. So I'm gonna do IP config to get my IP address from there and just run get webdav status with my IP address. In running that, we can see that it's unable to reach DAF pipe on my IP, which means that webdav client is unfortunately disabled. Good job, video is over. See you guys on the next one, just kidding. There's some ways that we can manually or programmatically actually start and engage with web client. Yes, you have me right, even where you have not an admin, you can still enable the service. And there's even binary for that. If I run enable web client.exe, which again, I'm gonna link into the description of that video, it's a simple assembly, I can start the web client service now if i do get service actually get service web client we can see it's actually running and now we can even confirm it with the previous assembly if i don't get web dev status i can see that web client service is now enabled to have more theory about how to programmatically enable web client refer to the blog post but now let's move on and exploit it now in order to enumerate web client services from a linux machine 
we can use the following project web client service scanner so after you download and install it we can just run web client service scanner specify the domain elsec.local slash jsmeet which is my user of course you need to have some kind of a authentication towards the domain and then specify the machine where you think web client can be enabled after running that, I need to supply my password and after a little bit of time, I should see if the web client is actually enabled or disabled remotely. So we don't have to stick with Windows, but also this can be done from a Linux standpoint. And we can indeed see that the web client service is actually running. Okay, now we have the web client service, but what to do with it? The very first thing is to actually set up your VLA environment. In that case, it's been done with Impacket NTLM VLAX, which is the tool which is, I believe, the best tool to go when performing relays so far. Now, the NTLM VLA needs the minus T flag, which is the target, and the target is where the authentication is going to go when it comes to you first. So, in other words, we have to forward it. Now, this is the DC, of course, because we want to access the LDAP on the DC, and then we have two very important flags. Three very important flags. First one is minus minus remove mic. What that flag is gonna do is it's gonna downgrade the incoming NTLM V2 by default into NTLM V1. Then we're gonna do SMB2 support because if that flag is missing, most of the Windows machines, especially the new ones, are not gonna even consider performing any kind of authentication in the first place. And then the third flag is minus minus delegate access, which is going to perform resource-based constraint delegation over the attacked machine. Now, the resource-based constraint delegation is a delegation most of the time regarding machine accounts or user, user account against machine accounts. And it allows, if it's completed, to impersonate any user for any service over that machine account. Now, after that's been done, we need to do one very, very important thing. When we talk about resource-based constraint delegation or coercion or relay attacks, it's always best of the case to work with FQDNs or DNS names instead of IP address. In order to do it, we need to make sure that our carry machine is known via the DNS to other machines. And that's been done by modifying or adding a record to the global ADDNS service. ADDNS, Active Directory DNS, Integrated DNS, is a service which is applicable for all the Active Directory. And when you add a record there, all the machines would know your CAD machine. Now that's been done with, if I go to my opt -Kir -B -B -A -X, that's been done with a tool called dns2.py. And this is the syntax. We need the domain slash user, password, of course, the domain and the action is going to be at. The record name is going to be Kali, and then the data is my IP. Now, when that thing happens, of course, we need to again target the DC. When that thing happens, all the machine account, when they say NS up Kali, they're going to point to me. So let's showcase if that's the case. Usually it takes some time, so that's why I already ran the command. Okay, so if I log in back, I can open up PowerShell real quick, like that. And here do NS up Kali. And as you can see, my IP is there and it's ready to rock. All right, so we have the, the DNS record. We have the relay set up in place. The last thing we need is to actually coerce or force the authentication. That's been done with the tool called Coercion. You can also use alternatives like Petit Potom, but I enjoy Coercion more because it has more interfaces that it can scan and then coerce. Now, the options are simple. We have Coerce as the first option. This is the mode on how the coercion is going to work. Then we have the listener address, and this is Kali, my DNS node, and then at 80. This specifies that we're going to use HTTP for incoming authentication. We're going to use NTLM over HTTP. And then we specify something non-existent like test. The minus T is the target. In that case, it's my SQL server. The domain is self-explanatory, username, password, and always continue is going to probe all the interfaces instead of stopping on each step. After I run it, we can right off the bat see something's going on, on the left. And if we pay close attention, we can see it's something interesting. First, we see that authentication is succeeded. So that means we successfully captured the authentication from SQL01 and successfully forwarded it, forwarded it to the domain and it accepted our, our forward action. Then with that, new machine account is being created. Adding new machine account. This is why minus minus delegate access is getting into place. After that, the machine account with this username and this password is generated. And after that, 
the delegation rights over SQ01 are modified, which means that now this machine account can impersonate all users on SQ01, including domain administrator, sysadmins, help desks, or enterprise admins. Keep in mind that if user is in protected group, this attack will not be applicable with that user, so we have to impersonate someone else. Now we have the machine account, let's now generate a ticket and this being done with get st command. So we can do in packet get st, this is going to do get service ticket and we're going to request service ticket impersonating administrator over the SIFS service of SQL01. With that in mind, the syntax is self-explanatory. We again pass the credentials, but that time the credentials for the newly created machine account. So I have to clean up my previous testings and keep in mind that, that you also have to include the door sign because this lets the Windows know and the domain controller know that we are authenticating as an actual machine account and not a user account. Okay, so I believe that little bit there is still in my password. I hope that's the case. And after I run it, I see an error. Now, let me switch back to a different directory because here I obviously don't have permissions over. And now let's rerun the very same command. After I run it, we can see there's a new error which says something different. And this error is quite common. This error means then that the time between your machine and the domain controller is desynced, is different. And it's easy to fix with sudo ntpdate minus four and specifying the domain controller. This is gonna sync the data automatically, so the two machines gonna have the same time. After I run it, the clock is being synced, and if I run the very same get st command, we can see that now we have a ticket for administrator user. All right, now I have the ticket for the administrator. This is from my previous testing. Now I have the ticket for the administrator over the SIF service or the SQL1, and now I need to import it, and it's been done with the command export krb 5 cc name. This is the environmental variable which holds the ticket uh, which can be used for, let's say, for the script striking packet or other programs. Now I can do Kali and then administrator eosec.local and quote the ticket like that, and we should be good to go. Now I can try in packet, let's see, psexec minus k, no pass, sq one run it, and we have SMB session error, status more processing required, still busy. And this means that most likely I somehow corrupted the whole process of my previous testing. So let me reboot the environment and try again. As you can see now, I have reboot my environment by running the very same command. Now it works perfect. Keep in mind that it's important when you exit in packet PS exec to not spam it like me with control C, but to type exit because then the impact is gonna do cleanup and it's gonna execute nice and gentle. But when you smash control C, there's a chance that something like this can happen and then break your lateral movement because of, let's say, stupidity. But now, as you can see, it works perfectly. Works perfectly. After one more reboot, because I claimed it worked perfectly, now we can see that it works. I'm gonna avoid the word perfectly in the future. We can see that the username is anti authority system, which means that we privileged escalate successfully. Now, keep in mind that this can be used not only for previous, but for remote client attacks. So, for instance, if you find a client where these requirements are there, it has the web client, the channel binding and signing are not enforced but enabled, you can successfully compromise remote clients. We used it for previous because we manually enabled web client, but if it's already enabled, why don't just compromise the machine? So that's a powerful techniques. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.